Um, so hopefully you're here to take part in an Asian whiskey tasting. If you're not, then, and you are expecting to speak to your family or something like that, then I'm sorry, this is the wrong call for you. Uh, this is the Asian whiskey tasting. Uh, my name is Eddie. I'm the founder of the Whiskey Lounge, along with my uh, good lady who is currently on furlough, so you won't be seeing her, where well, you might see her drift past in the kitchen at some point. Um, but we are essentially the Whiskey Lounge. Uh, we have lots of lovely helpers who come and help us at our events. Um, helpers is probably not uh, a very uh, applicable word, but never mind. Um, but anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna go through some some uh, some whiskies here, and I'm gonna take you through a presentation just to help illustrate. I'm sure my kitchen is not really going to uh, expand your imagination or your knowledge of of, of these whiskies that we're gonna taste. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share with you a presentation. So if you just bear with me while I do that. Um, I will put on the the chat thingy here as well. So if you've got any questions, then uh, please do um, type a message in here, and I will do my very best to um, to answer that question. Obviously, if you can try and keep it to between the whiskies or at an appropriate point, that would be great. Um, but anyway, let me just share this presentation with you guys. Right, so I'm hoping you can see this this map of uh, of Asia and uh, uh, the back end of Russia and um, so on, um, just to give you an idea of where we're talking about. So the whiskies that we're going to be um, tasting and talking about this evening are from India, obviously, you can see India there. Um, Taiwan, which is out to the sort of southeast of China. And also Japan, obviously, which is just right to the east. And, um, anyway, so the first whiskey we're going to taste is a Kavalan. So Kavalan is from Taiwan. Images you can see here of our, our, our Taipei, obviously. Taipei is the principal city, the capital. Um, really, for, for a city, it's, it's very nice. I've been, I was there a couple of years ago. I was very lucky to, um, to, uh, to be invited across and um, had a wonderful time, albeit four or five days of uh, enjoying Taiwan. Um, I'm pretty sure it took four or five days to get there and back, but it was worth it. And Taipei, lovely place. Um, and Taiwan that we saw of it was was, was really interesting too. Um, as you can see, it's a third of the size of Scotland, the, um, the island of, of Taiwan, but it has a four times the population. So it's, it's quite populous, um, particularly in the bigger cities, obviously. Um, the distillery itself, as you can see up there, up in the uh, northeast quadrant of the of the country, um, and quite a distillery it is as well. I mean, it's to say it's a it's a marvel of modern science would be a would be an understatement. The the care and the passion, as well as the money that has gone into this distillery, cannot be underestimated. Um, it is having been to dozens of Scottish distilleries and other distilleries around the world uh, it is without question one of the most impressive facilities I've ever had the fortune to, to, to travel to. And um, if you're ever in the area, you should definitely go. I mean, one of the, one of the, the most impressive things about it, statistic is that it welcomes more visitors per year than all of the distilleries in Scotland and Ireland wrapped up together, which is just, uh, it's just a phenomenal statistic. Um, but obviously you have a lot of visitors coming from mainland China to, uh, to come and visit the distillery, which has many, many fans around the world. I mean, it is 
as you'll see, it's multi, multi, multi award winning. Okay. <clears throat> so Cavalan is the name of Elan County where the distillery is located. Uh, it's the old name, so it's the, the, the tribal name for the for the county, if you like. I'm just going to. Uh, this is whiskey number one that you should all have. You can see there's very little left in this bottle for some reason. I'm quite sure what happened to that. I think there might be a hole in the bottom of it. But anyway, I'm going to pour myself a, a small measure. The one good thing, well, one of the good things about this uh, isolation lark is that I don't need to drive after doing a tasting so I can fully participate, which I hope you can uh, uh, appreciate. Obviously, I won't participate too much, otherwise this tasting will be very short and all you'll see is me with my head down asleep on the screen, which is not what you want. Um, so, assuming that you've got this uh, dram poured, why don't we have a little look at this while we're looking at these, um, this presentation. So, this is the Cavalan Classic. Uh, so, this is, this is what we would term the flagship single malt. So, when we say flagship, um, essentially, it means the one that comes before all the others. It, it's the one that um, plows the field for the rest of the range. And it's the same for, you know, any distillery. So, you know, your Glenmorangie is your 10-year-old Glenmorangie. Your Lagavulin is your 16-year-old Lagavulin, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's the one that makes everything else pos possible. So the classic is key to the range at Cavalan. Um, it is as it should be one of my favorites in the range, I have to say, because I think it's, it gives a really good uh, indication of a stamp, as it were, of what Cavalan should and does taste like. So hopefully you've got um, an appropriate tasting vessel. A wine glass is perfectly acceptable, by the way, and I can often be seen drinking whiskey from a wine glass if there's nothing else available. Uh, I'm using these uh, Glencairn tasting glasses, which we tend to use for all of our tastings, so we've got quite a lot of them hanging about. Um, now, in terms of the tasting itself, first of all, I would look at the colour. The ideal way to do that is actually to hold a white sheet um, below the um, or, or behind the glass to get an idea of the color um, and so the classic is I would say a sort of medium amber uh, golden amber color very attractive whiskey color you might like to say um, <clears throat> so color wise color wise I wouldn't get too hung up um, obviously Colour is important, but it's more about the information we get from our nose and our palate. So, yes, colour is important, but it's not as important as how it smells and how it tastes. Ultimately, they will be the governing factors over your enjoyment of the whiskey. I mean, sure, some people see a light coloured whiskey and say, well, well, that's not going to taste of much. But quite often it will because it's, you know, it might be a peated whiskey that's not been in a very active cask or, or whatever. So color doesn't always give an indication of, of what the um, what the flavor of the whiskey is going to be. Um, so I can tell you that the Cavalan Classic is a combination of ex-bourbon and ex-sherry. Um, it is, believe it or not, no more than around four and a half years old. So it is not an old whiskey whatsoever, but we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Let's give it a little nose. Now I'm nosing and tasting it at full strength to begin with. Um, that's just the way I do things. You know, I like to give each whiskey its own individual chance at, at, at making me smile. And as part of that, I will, I will, I tend to nose and taste uh, whiskey at full strength first before adding water. Um, this is bottled at 40%. And to be honest, having tasted this many, many times in a dramming situation, uh, maybe a session whiskey situation. It doesn't really require water because it's so good to begin with. But let's give it a smell and a taste. Now, I might throw some flavors at you that you may disagree with or you may be scratching your head. Don't worry about it. You know, I've, I've been doing tastings for a long, long time. Um, I have a 
fairly wacky imagination some of the time. So sometimes things will come off my tongue, which uh, otherwise wouldn't. Um, so don't worry if you, if, you, if you don't find those flavors in there. Sometimes people find those flavors because that's what you say. Uh, it's power of suggestion. It works very, very well, but it's up to you what you find in the whiskey. But anyway. Mm. So what I find and, and what tends to be the, the classic Cavalan template really is this tropical fruity flavor. I get, I know that sounds crazy in a whiskey, but bear with me. But the flavors I get from Cavalan are almost like tinned peaches and, and pineapples and really luscious juicy fruits. So even though I've just taken a taste of it, I find my mouth watering, which sounds kind of perverse, but that's, that's, that's the way it is. And um, don't be afraid if you find the same, it's fine. You're okay. I'm going to add a tiny bit of water from my very glamorous jug here. Now water with whiskey, I'm, I'm sure some of you have done whiskey tastings either with us or other people before. Um, a lot of people, in fact, every tasting I do, someone will bring up the subject of adding water if I don't. Um, should I or shouldn't I add water? The simple answer to that is you do what you're most comfortable with. Don't listen to anybody else, okay? Even me. Um, I, <laughs> I add water to whiskey to extract as much aroma and, and flavor information as possible. It's a tool uh, in your armory, should you choose to use it, in order to really just drill down into the the, the, the more complex aromas and um, flavors within the whiskey. Um, I do a little bit of whiskey judging every year. Um, I do at the IWSC, which is the International Wines and Spirits Competition. And I've been doing it now for 10 years, I think. And the first year I did it, I tried to do it without water. And you're talking about a tasting or as you know, each session you taste between 65, 70, 75 um, whiskeys. And that's over three or four days. The first session I ever tried, I think I tried to do it without water. In fact, I know I did. And um, it was a big mistake, both from a analysis point of view, but also from a sobriety point of view. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine. I mean, we do spit the whiskies out, but even so. Um, but what I found in the second session when I was started to add water, like all of the other people, the sensible people were, is that I was starting to notice more flavors, not necessarily better flavors, but more flavor information. So the ability to actually identify individual flavors, which were otherwise hidden by the, the alcohol uh, naturally in the whiskey. Uh, so water, very much see it as a tool. If you, if you taste a whiskey and you like it as it is, then there's no need to mess around with it. But if you, if you perhaps find it out of balance or it's too alcoholic or, or whatever else, then water can really help just, just calm it down a bit. But it also uh, underlines certain flavors. PT whiskey is very interesting, you know, if you add water to peatier whiskies, it tends to emphasize the smokier notes in the whiskey. Uh, so if you like a big slap around the jowls from, from peated whiskies, then um, adding water to them really, really helps. Anyway, let's get on with this. So as you can see, the distillery, um, that's not the best look of the distillery. I didn't see that bit, but that's, uh, that's the more industrial side of it. But essentially it's, Part of the miracle is that this place was completed in nine months uh, and started making its new make uh, on the 11th of March. I mean, that's, that's, that's an incredible achievement, but you know, that's what happens when you've got a wool and a way and a few, well, lots of millions of uh, Taiwanese dollars to, to spend. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a nice picture of it. Uh, obviously the large building sort of to the right middle of the of the screen is where 
most of the 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 distilling happens um now there are um five pairs of of stills so 10 operating forsyth stills which so it's it's now making a lot of whiskey which is uh well frankly it's it's pretty good um so in terms of the raw materials the malted barley for cavalan is imported from europe um as you can imagine uh east asian country most of the grain grown there is rice um uh, in common with 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 china um so barley is a pretty, you know it's at a premium so it has to be imported from europe um they use a wide range of malted barley's different strains the main concern as with most distilleries around the world is alcohol yield and um uh, resistance to disease so it really is about how much booze can we make out of this cereal uh, as long as it's very good quality at the same time um, the yeasts they use a couple of different kinds of yeast um, and they're using yeasts that will give them the fruity esters they're looking for in fermentation which will then lead to a fruitier whiskey um, a fruitier spirit um, but they use them from France and South Africa. And then the water comes from the locally, um, local central and snow mountain range. Okay. Um, these, are, these are the stills in the, <laughs> I say the old still house, but this is the original still house. Um, as you can see, they, they look like proper stills. They, that's because they are, they are Forsyth stills. So Forsyth, is um, a very famous in the industry anyway name it's the it's the premier producer of uh, distilling equipment including the stills so certainly going back a couple of years ago there was uh, a two-year waiting list for stills from Forsyth. i mean they were incredibly popular and for good reason you know they make they make the best traditional pot stills in the industry and here you can see the warehouse, um, some of the different casks used. Um, the warehouse for me was one of the most fascinating places in Cavalan. Uh, you can't really see there, but we were there when the, it was a hive of activity and they were, they were really um, going for it, moving casks about, emptying casks and so on. Um, but the, um, the funniest thing was that the guys and gals wear this kind of colored uniform which makes them look like a formula one team you know very coordinated they i mean they look like they're ready to rock at any point and super efficient um so uh okay so we move on to the next one so this is just a, a, a little slide about the, the classic there you can see a lot of the trophies that they won for this whiskey um taipei 101 the, the one which is one of the one of the world's tallest buildings now it's certainly not the tallest anymore um which but it was it was uh some time ago i think it's still in the top 10 and we we went up it and it certainly felt tall um and so it kind of explains the the, the shape of the bottle but frankly it's not about the bottle it's what's in the bottle and and luckily the the whiskey is good too there you can see even the the in-house tasting notes are all about tropical fruit of mango and pineapple uh maybe i've been influenced by that i don't know but it, it for me that's that's what it really it really comes across as anyway what do you think do you like it that's 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 the main thing it doesn't matter if i like it or not it matters if you like it i'm just going to go um back to the uh Back to the main screen, hopefully. Mm. There we go. Okay. How are we all doing? I will. Um, I will put you on audio and video at some point when I when I feel comfortable that we've got everyone we should have. Um, but I hope you don't mind at the moment. I'm just going to keep it still. Uh, I don't see any. Um, I don't see any messages at the minute, so hopefully I'm, I'm answering your questions as I go along. 
otherwise, please do ask me a question. Um, apologies if I do miss anything. Obviously, we you know we have a limited time together, so it's impossible to get absolutely everything in. But I, I I'll try my best. Okay, let's have a quick little revisit to the Catalan. If possible, maybe I'm a bit late in saying this, try and keep a little bit of each whiskey in your glass as we go through. I, I tend to just have a couple of sips and then leave it so that I can go back to it later on to compare it to the other whiskies that we're tasting. Uh, if you haven't done that, don't worry about it, it's fine. Um, the, luckily the whiskey will, the flavor of the whiskey will linger in the glass for hours to come. So you can still go back to it and sniff it. Hi, Chris, how are you doing? Oh, he's going in. It's funny that how some people's videos seem to pop up and then disappear. But anyway, so that's whiskey number one. Now, whiskey number two, you should have the Amrut. Um, this is Amrut single malt, 46%. Um, like, well, pretty much all of these whiskeys and a lot of the whiskeys that, that um, that we work with uh, through the years. You know, I've, I've had a fairly long relationship with Amrit, um, well, not, not not this particular Amrit, but the, 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 the business, if you like, the guys that, that put it together. Uh, we were, how do I say this without sounding big headed, but we were quite instrumental in the very early days for Amrit launching in the UK, doing a series of tastings, introducing Amrit to the UK public going back I don't know, seven, eight years ago, maybe more, maybe 10 years ago. Um, so I know I know the whiskeys very well. I'm just gonna hop back into this slideshow here. So hopefully we're gonna go to here. So here we have India, obviously you recognize the, the country itself. And you can see Bangalore right down in the south, not, not right in the south, south, southmost tip, but not too far really. Bangalore, um, 3,000 feet above sea level. The, the average or the max minimum temperatures and the average humidity, what we didn't talk about really was with Cavalan, which is okay because we can talk about it now, is you know this, this high average temperature and in, in Taiwan, the average humidity, I think is 60%. Um, forty percent in Bangalore. Um, this this is key to particularly these two distilleries. Not quite so much the um, the the Nika, the Japanese whiskies we're going to be tasting, but particularly to Amrit and to Cavalan. In yeah, it's very much part of their success story. Part of their DNA is that they are because of this very high humidity and, and high heat, average heat. What it means is that when the whiskey goes into the cask is you can almost imagine it's, it's kind of bubbling away, you know, it's not literally, but it is having a huge impact on the speed of the conversation between the spirit and the oak. So it is in a set, in effect, it is super maturing. So like a super speed maturation. So both for uh, whiskies from the whiskies from India, Amra, and indeed Paul John from a bit further um, to the west and, and north, um, and Cavalan uh, in Taiwan, is that both of these whiskies will mature faster, and therefore will be bottled earlier than an equivalent single malt from Scotland. Yeah, so. Both Amra and Cavalan, you know, their, their average age of their flagship bottlings, such as these that we're tasting just now, um, would be no more than four years old, four and a half years old, maybe, uh, which sounds ridiculous. I mean, I have tasted some good four, four and a half, five year old Scotch single malts, but the few and far between, um, they, it's not an age that most Scottish distillers would want to bottle at because most single malts of Scotland at that age simply would not be ready to be bottled and, and drank. 
um, unless they've been in a really active cask. Uh, so, but for these guys, that's that's everyday uh, bottling. You know, they don't bottle beyond that in the main. Amra, I think, did a 10-year-old some years ago. But, you know, I think even by their own admission, they wouldn't choose to bottle at 10 years. It's just because they wanted to. I think it was a 10th anniversary at the time. And, uh, you know, obviously it was very popular and people wanted to, to taste it. But um, night, night. Sorry, it's my daughter saying good night. Um, but uh, in the main, they would they would prefer to bottle at this at this at this age. Now, the great thing nowadays for both Amrit, Cavalan, uh, and pretty much any worldwide whiskey is that the seeds have already been sown for what we call non-age statement whiskies. So, in Scotland. There is, as I'm sure you may be aware, a real issue with aged stock. So there's a real problem with um, stock 15 years or more, um, simply because they sold too much of it. They, all the, you know, you can't blame them for that. They they were uh, they wanted to sell their whiskey, and they ended up selling more than 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 probably they should have done, but you know, business is business. They wanted to sell the whiskey. So um, they sold more than they they, they could um, replace. And therefore, a lot of distilleries in Scotland are still playing catch up. They don't have as much aged stock in their warehouses as they would have had 20 years ago or so. And that means they had to be more creative with their branding and with their bottling. So you've seen um, whiskies from lots of Scotch distillers that won't have an aid statement on. It'll have a, a, a name, maybe a Gallic name, uh, which means something, um, but no aid statement. And that's become quite common, particularly if you go through travel retail or duty free, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and a lot of the whiskies there now have carry no aid statement. It is starting to come back round, but it's going to take a few years for them to recover. But what that means is that people have become accustomed to buying whiskies that don't contain an age statement or don't display an age statement, which means when you come to taste things like Amrit, Cavalan, and so on, and you don't see an age statement, that's okay because we, 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 we have already accepted the fact that not every whiskey carries an age statement and it doesn't always, uh, or certainly doesn't always um, relate back to the quality of the whiskey. Um, with um, Amrit and Cavalan, it's a very, very happy thing because if they were to put an age statement on the bottle, they would have to put something along the lines of four years old. And frankly, how many people are going to go for a four-year-old Indian whiskey over a 15-year-old single malt Scottish whiskey? But in actuality, because of the high heat, humidity in those countries, you're looking at a maturation that equates to roughly three to four times faster than that that happens in Scotland. So if you, know, if you were to take a five-year-old Scotch whiskey, or sorry, a five-year-old um, Indian whiskey from Amrit, factor in a three or four times uh, maturation um, super fast forward, you're looking at a whiskey between 15 and 20 years old, roughly speaking, from Scotland. So that, that three, four years in Bangalore or in, in Taiwan is, is much closer to 12, 15, 20 years in, in Scotland, which is a massive advantage. I mean, you think about it, you know, you're, you're, they're having to wait a third to, or a quarter to a third of the time for a whiskey, which, which is now you know, tasting like something much more mature. Um, but anyway, I digress. So this Amrit is bottled at 46%, yeah? Let's have a little uh, nose, if you haven't already. Now, with the Amrit, you'll find, compared to the Cavalan, the Cavalan's super sweet, tropical fruity, as we, as we found out. Amrit, for me, is much more about the raw material, about the barley particularly. 
Um, and when I put my nose in a glass of amaret, one of the first things that I smell is the, is, is the cereal, the barley, which I, I really like. I mean, I, I like both equally, but um, certainly with amaret, the trademark barley cereal composition is, is really delicious. And there's, there is a reason for that, which I'll tell you about in a second. So we'll have a little taste as well at full strength. Slander of Ron Bowie. Mm. So in common with any whiskey, well, with any, any consumable really, um, for me, the flavor should follow the nose so that there should be a, a continuation of the story of, of what we've discovered from the nose of the whiskey. And for me, you still get that. It just reminds me, it reminds me of being in, in, in a malt floor, a floor maltings. Um, just a lovely kind of cereal aromatic flavor about it. Quite, quite different to the Cavalan, isn't it? I mean, the Cavalan, like I say, super sweet, tropical fruity, lovely, lovely. Whereas this for me is much earthier, probably slightly more old fashioned in style, I would say more an old fashioned Scottish whiskey rather than the Cavalan, which is possibly modeled on a more modern style of Scotch single malt. Uh, although I could be talking nonsense. Um, right, let's just see. So, so this here slide gives you an idea of, of why we're talking about cereally flavors. Um, so the barley that you would use for single malt in Scotland, generally speaking, would be two row barley, which is common in Europe. Um, and you can see that on the left hand side of the diagram there. The in India, where uh, Amrit gets its barley from the barley grown is, is what we call six row barley. And you can again, you can see the cross section of the, the ear of, of barley there. And essentially, from my understanding, and I'm not a scientist, but because the barley seeds are slightly are more packed together in the in the in the ear there, uh, it means that there's less room for growth within the seed itself. So within the uh, within the, the the heart of the seed, if you were. So what tends to happen is that. Um, the the skin of the seed actually actually seem uh, tends to be the dominant aspect of the of the six row barley and it, so that's the husk and it's the husk which gives the more uh cereally note so the the inside of the seed contains the what will be the fermentable sugar whereas the husk is the is, is the more kind of um rustic flavors if you like um it also gives a lower yield because of that, because you're going to produce less fermentable sugar, but that's just, uh, you know, it's acceptable loss. It's, uh, they would rather have the flavor that they, that they have, um, from the six row barley. So that's, that's definitely a unique thing about, uh, about Amrit. It's the six row barley. That's the distillery. I haven't had the pleasure to go yet. I feel like I've been there many times. I've certainly tasted enough of their whiskies and been in the company of, of the fine folks that, um, that operate the, the distillery and, and sell the stuff. Um, and, you know, they, they, they love, they love whiskey. They love what they do and uh, they love producing great whiskey. So it's all good. And here's a, just a slide about the, the whiskey itself. Um, see what you think. Does it taste anything like those? I definitely get the savory, spicy notes. I'm going to add a little bit of water to mine. Um, you'll see that it's bottled at 46%. You see mention of this non-chill filtered business. And you'll see this um, across whiskey ranges um, all over the place, Scotland, England, wherever. Um, and this 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 references a process that doesn't happen to the whiskey, okay, rather than the process that, that does happen to it. Chill filtering was introduced when uh, Scotch whiskey, particularly, was becoming 
extremely commercially viable and popular. And there was the discovery that at particularly cold temperatures, if you if you bottled the whiskey at less than 46%, the whiskey would go cloudy in the bottle. It would throw a haze. It would almost look like a hoe garden or, or something like that, which obviously for a lot of people looking at a cloudy bottle of whiskey, hmm, that doesn't quite look right, does it? So in order to combat this, chill filtering was developed, which was a method of essentially combing out fatty acids from the and lipids from the from the from the from the liquid post um, distillation and maturation so essentially you reduce it to two to three degrees centigrade and then you pass it through a rough filter which essentially the fatty acids and lipids coagulate almost like an um, egg whites and you can, this, this this filter will just gently remove those those oily um, substances uh, which is fine you know that's been done now for for decades um, and nobody's complained it's okay um, but as we moved into the sort of late 20th century um, a few distillers started to say hold on a minute you know we're we're doing this to to this whiskey but we're not quite sure if it's the right thing to do and so one or two distillers started to bottle their whiskies at 46% and leave them unchill filtered or non-chill filtered. And in terms, in terms of flavor, it has zero impact. There is, there's no impact on flavor from chill filtering. It's texture. It's how the whiskey feels as it leaves your mouth and goes down your throat, particularly. And what people were discovering for themselves was that when you taste a non-chill filtered whiskey versus a chill filtered whiskey is that you would get a slightly more viscous oily texture which otherwise was was not apparent necessarily in the in the chill filtered whiskey now some people still to this day disagree and don't think it's a thing um but it for those that believe in it, it opens up another dimension in terms of the whiskey tasting side of things. So you've got the nose, so aromas in the nose, you've got the, the palate, and then you've got the finish. So how does it feel? How does it, you know, what, what does it feel like when it goes down? And, you know, certainly I, I like, this may be completely, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? superficial but i like the idea of and i'm sure you do too of, of whiskey with now taken out so it's 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 not had something done to it that isn't absolutely necessary yeah and you know don't get me wrong there are dozens if not hundreds much more than that probably of single malt and blended whiskies that i've tasted which have been chill filtered which I've thought are amazing, and I will go on to, to enjoy them. Um, but if you gave me a choice and you said to me, right, if you could, if you, this, this one whiskey here, if you could have it chill filtered or unchill filtered, which would you choose? I, I would almost certainly go unchill filtered 100% of the time. I can't guarantee that, but I'm pretty sure I would. Um, so chill fil non-chill filtering rather is, tends to be aimed at the specialist market. You know, for those of us, whiskey nuts who, who want more and more out of their whiskey, yeah? Anyway, a slanger. Mm. That was good. So I've added a little bit of water to that, as you saw. It doesn't have quite the same dramatic effect as it did with the Cavalan. With the Cavalan, for me, it brought out more citrus notes. With the with the Amrit, it's possibly more brought more of the spicier notes out, if anything. Um, so we're going to move on to the next whiskey, which is the Nika Miyagyo, 
Miyagi-kyo, uh, which is the second distillery facility of Nika. The first being Yoichi, which we're going to taste directly after this, happily enough. Um, but I'm just going to pour myself a little bit of this. Now, as you know, I'm, well, I'm a massive fan of whiskey full stop, but I'm a massive fan of Japanese whiskey, as I'm sure many of you are too. And I just, I think the story of Japanese whiskey for me is, is one of the most fascinating and almost you couldn't make it up stories that are out there. I'm not going to go into it into too much detail because there's so much written about it already. And frankly, many people much better at writing about it and talking about it than me have, have come before and will go after. Um, but I'll give you a very brief synopsis. Um, so a guy called Masataka Takutsuru, that's Masataka Takutsuru. He, he and a guy called Shinjiro Tori are what we recognize as the, the godfathers of Japanese whiskey. Um, now, Masataka was born to a, a sake-making family, um, but his, his main passion was whiskey. He didn't want to make sake. He wanted to make whiskey. And he, but he wanted to make it in, in, in the Scottish way of making it, but, but had an idea of how to make it, but wasn't quite there yet. So he managed to fall in with a businessman who had plans to make whiskey in Japan, um, but didn't have any of the know-how that Masataka had. And Masataka convinced him to let him go to Scotland to learn how to make whiskey the Scottish way. And that's exactly what he did. So he traveled to Scotland via, via um, the US in um, 1918 or 1919, I can remember, never remember which one, and um, arrived in Scotland, um, essentially enrolled in Glasgow University uh, part-time, um, and the rest of the time spent two two and a bit years traveling around the distilleries of Scotland um, and not just in one region, but in many regions, um, Speyside, Campbelltown, um, learning, drilling down into how to make Scotch whiskey, you know, and, you know, I'm sure producing beautiful notes and, and diagrams, uh, which he, uh, which he then took back to Japan with him. He also took back his wife, Rita, who he met whilst he was uh, in Scotland. And they both went back to Japan together. And unfortunately, the businessman that, that Masataka had uh, talked into sending him to Scotland, uh, his business had taken a bit of a nosedive. And so it wasn't to be in terms of whiskey making with him. But at the same time, a guy called Shinjiro Tori, um, uh, who was a, a, a very big businessman, but also a really big whiskey fan, the two of them hooked up and created the Yamazaki Distillery, which is which was and is the first um, purpose-built whiskey distillery in Japan, uh, and that was opened in 1923. Um, however, they didn't agree from the very start uh, in terms of production, style of production, in terms of where the distillery should be and all that kind of thing. Um, Shinjiro was very much of the more commercial minded, you know, we're going to do it closer to Tokyo. It's going to be um, you know, a modern style of facility using uh, the most modern distilling equipment available. Um, whereas Masataka was very much having obviously been to Scotland, witnessed the very, you know, at that stage, there would have been still obviously very traditionally made single malts in Scotland. And, and, he, and he wanted to make it in a place which was much more like Scotland. And that place was uh, the North Island, Hokkaido. And, um, and that's where he went. So he, he, he upped sticks when they eventually fell out entirely and built his own distillery up in Hokkaido in 1934, I think. Might be a year or two out. Um, 
which was Yoichi. And to this day, Yoichi is a very, very traditionally made single malt whiskey. So they use uh, direct fired stills, they use peated barley, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's a very, very traditional style of, of, of whiskey making that goes on there. The, whisk, the Miyagi-kyo, on the other hand, which was opened in 69, I think it was, um, is much more modern. So they have uh, around a dozen sets of stills, um, pairs of stills, each of which is a different shape and size in order to recreate pretty much any style of, of single malt whiskey. Very, very clever. Similar to Hakshu's facility that was opened in the early 70s. Um, and certainly facilities that the Scottish have, have since uh, learned from themselves. So, you know, it's kind of come full circle. So there's, there's certainly a lot of learnings and, and teachings from, from Japanese whiskey making, which has influenced Scot you know, some Scottish distillers as well. So it's really, really come full circle. So Miyagi-kyo, the single malt from Miyagi-kyo, though, the main style of it was designed to be more Speyside in character, whereas Yoichi was more on the sort of island, isla style. Well, I, I would certainly say the, the, the Yoichi we're tasting tonight is not quite as isla, certainly more old-fashioned isla, maybe Campbelltown style. Um, so, but Miyagi-kyo is much more on the space side side of things. There's also a grain distillery at, um, at Miyagi-kyo um, on the site of, this, the, of the single malt distillery, which means that they can make a blended Japanese whiskey, uh, which they do very successfully um, from the two single malts, uh, Yoichi and Miyagi-kyo. Anyway, so... I've just poured myself. So this is bottled at 45%, which is quite an odd bottling strength. I've never, I've never really got to the bottom of it. I'm sure there is a very reasonable explanation for it, but it's not chill filtered or sorry, it is chill filtered, but bottled at 45%. It doesn't do it any harm. Don't get me wrong. When you taste it, I'm sure you'll, you'll love it. And you stick your nose in there and straight away, for me, it's all about, Kind of boiled sweets and and um, some seared citrus and things like that. Mm. Really, really zesty, lovely kind of wake up juice. There's a ye faithful map of Japan, and you can see um, Yamazaki right down in the south, and then uh, Yoichi. You know, I mean, you couldn't, you almost couldn't get much further away. And there we have, so that's, that's, that's Masataka on the, on the left. And as he got older on the right hand side. And certainly I would say, yeah, I would agree with this, the father of Japanese whiskey, but I think he shared that with uh, uh, Shinjiro Tori. And there we go. So that's it. So Sendai is the kind of province and often you'll see uh, whiskey from this site referred to as Sendai and that's why because that's the, the province the kind of overall name of the facility including the the grain whiskey and there's the distillery let's have a taste so in terms of the sort of technical makeup of of both Yoichi and Miyagi Kyo they are very traditionally made traditionally in the Scottish style I would you know I would definitely say um, so double distilled using um, malted barley, um, generally imported malted barley like um, Cavalan. And in terms of the casks, uh, mainly ex-bourbon um, with, a, with a bit of ex-sherry, like most distilleries now, to be honest, ex-bourbon is, is, the, is the de rigueur, as it were, is the, is the one that most people go with because it's generally the most available um, with ex, you know, sherry, port, Madeira, et cetera, et cetera, being used almost like seasoning. So, you know, flipping whiskey from bourbon casks to sherry casks for a short time to give them a, a little bit of extra dimension. You know, that's, that's become a very common practice really since the 1990s. Anyway, what do we think of this? I really love the nose on it. I just think it's 
one of those whiskeys I could just smell and smell. Mm. Just lovely. There's a nice, there's a nice spicy um, tone to it too, which just just knits everything together really nicely. Interestingly, both Yoichi and Miyagikyo use a, a, a proportion of peat, whether it be small or slightly larger in, in terms of Yoichi, but certainly small in terms of Miyagikyo. I like to have a little bit of peat, almost like a uh, like a grinding of pepper, just to sort of temper the sweeter flavors of the whiskey. And for me, that's what these two, so the Miyagikyo and the Yoichi, bring to the game. You know, they're just so superbly balanced. So here's Yoichi, so 1934, which I think is what I said, wasn't it? Uh, right, where are we? So I've got one of the, I, mean, I love lots of whiskey, as I'm sure you can appreciate, but um, Yoichi has, does have a particularly, um, there's a particularly warm part of my whiskey drinking heart that, that thinks about Yoichi. And part of the reason is because we did, or I did a tasting years and years ago, uh, a Japan versus Scotland tasting, um, probably about 15 years ago, if not more, in which we tasted uh, whiskies from Scotland and Japan, obviously. Um, but we tasted them blind. And I, at the time I worked for Oddbins, which was a great place to, to work if you liked whiskey. And, and wanted to learn about whiskey. Um, but we couldn't, I couldn't get my hands on any whiskies from Nika, from, from these two distilleries particularly. Um, all we had was Suntory, which is fine because the whiskies were very, very good, don't get me wrong, but I was desperate to taste Yoichi because I'd heard about the fact that they used direct fired stills and um, yeah, they were, they were slightly more on the peaty side of things because I was really into very peaty whiskies at the time. Um, so I, the only place I could, I could find the stuff back then was the Whiskey Exchange, which has obviously become quite a, quite a thing in itself. Um, but the Yoichi, so we had a, it was a 15 year old Yoichi that I, that I got for that, that tasting. And we had it at the end along with, I think, I can't remember what the, the Scottish whiskey was we had, but it was, it was very good. Um, but the Yoichi, the 15 year old Yoichi and subsequent Yoichis I tasted, I just fell in love with. I just, and the idea of, of the very traditional practices that they still to this day use for me, I, maybe I'm a bit of an old romantic in that sense, but um, it, it just, it just makes me happy to think about. Um, so anyway, both of these Japanese single malts, the Yoichi and the, and the Sendai stroke Miyagi-kyo don't carry an age statement, uh, which, which is quite unusual or was unusual up until a few years ago, because most Japanese whiskies, certainly single malts did carry an age statement. So um, Yamazaki used to have 10, 12, 18 year old expressions. Uh, Yoichi used to be 10, 12, 15, 20. And similarly for Miyagi-kyo um, and for Hakushu, the other Suntory single malt. Um, unfortunately, not for them, or, for, or more for us, they became very popular. Similarly, although slightly later than, than Scotch single malts, they, they suddenly started selling huge amounts of the aged stock um, and weren't able to, to, you know, couldn't say no, we're not going to sell this stuff. But it meant that going forward, they didn't have so much aged, aged stock to, um, to sell, you know, now, for example. So both these uh, Yoichi and the Miyagi-kyo at the moment, the flagships, if you like, carry no age statement which is no bad thing. It just means that um, the whiskies within them are, there's possibly some younger stuff in there, maybe eight years old whiskey, but, but it's also being blended with 10, 12 year old whiskey at the same time. 
And certainly I think that there's still excellent whiskies. Don't get me wrong. I would love to see the age statements return, particularly for Yoichi uh, and Miyagi Kyo, because I think it, there's, I just miss that variation in the range. At the moment, all I can, all I can afford anyway is this, this the Yoichi, as we've got here, the single malt. Um, whereas in the past, you know, if I could drink the 10 year old, but and if I push the boat out, I could maybe buy a 15 year old. But at the moment, there's just no option to do that. I mean, you know, even if you go on auction, these whiskies are incredibly popular and, and therefore very expensive. But anyway, let's 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 have a taste of this. And again, this is 45 percent. So it's interesting tasting those back to back. They share some of the char some characteristics, but certainly the Miyagi Kyo for me is a lot fruitier, a lot zestier, whereas the, the Yoichi is a little bit more brooding and has a, a lovely kind of it's more sort of peppery peat than full on medicinal peat. And like I say, it's more there to balance things out than to give it you know, too much of a medicinal smoky flavor. Um, it's more about what does it bring to the show in order to combine with the other flavors rather than dominate the other flavors. I'm going to put a tiny bit of water in and see what happens to it. Yeah, so you definitely get a little bit more emphasis of the smokiness with, with the addition of water. But still, it's not dominant. It's not dominant. Mm. It's, still, it's quite light, you know. It's not a it's not a real heavyweight bruiser of a whiskey. It's quite, dare I say, delicate. You know, it's not it's not designed to just wallop your palate. It really is quite aromatic and, and uh, complex. Okay, I hope you're enjoying it anyway. Now, so this this is about the, the Amrit Fusion that we're going to taste just now. As you can see, this is 50% alcohol, so it is pretty strong. It's not quite cask strength, but it's not far off. Um, I would imagine, in fact, for India, this, you know, this would be pretty much cask strength. Um, as you can see, this this is 80% of the Indian, so the um, six row barley, and but then 20% Scottish peated barley, uh, which obviously is going to have quite an impact on 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 the final spirit. Um, you can see it's aged for 100% of the time in American ex bourbon casks. Um, and you, I mean, the color of that, I can't see because the screens are in the way. Let me just see if I can, no, I can't do this. Uh, but five and a half years in ex-bourbon casks and probably refill bourbon casks at that, there won't be, I don't think they'll be first fill. The color of that is incredible. I mean, and I know that there's nothing added color wise to that whiskey. It can be added to whiskies, but um, generally speaking, for uh, for certainly for Indian, Taiwanese, Japanese whiskies, rarely would spirit caramel be added, if at all, um, because there's no need. You know, the climate allows them to age the stuff so quickly, and that includes the color. As you all know, whiskey when it comes off the still looks like this, uh, looks like gin or vodka. Um, and it's only when it goes into cask when it starts to develop the color as well as the flavor. Um, but anyway, so five and a half years, American ex bourbon, 20% Scottish peated. So, hence the name fusion. It's a fusion of Scottish and Indian barley. So, you get, you get, you get that. Um, and for me, of, of the two Amrits, I love the normal Amrit, but for me, even though I've never been to India and 
another place I'd love to go to. Uh, it smells what I imagine, you know, the, the kind of spice markets and all that kind of thing. You're really, it's got that really rich aromatic spiciness on the nose. I don't get as much of the peat. I think it's partly the peat that's providing that spiciness to the to the um, natural occurring spices from the maturation. Let's have a, a nose and a, and a taste. Again, even through that really rich maturation, um, you can smell the barley. I, don't, I think I hope you get that. Definitely get that. Um, cereal note. Mm. Yeah. And again, lots of spiciness, lots of richness, but for me, the, the main central note still remains, which is this lovely aromatic cereal note, which is the is the for me is the hallmark of amrit it's it's quite unique in a way to to amrit distillery and, and i think it, it it's part of you know what sets it apart from 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 other whiskies you know, every whiskey has its kind of um dna it's a unique dna and that for me is, is what it is with the with the amrit but what do you think do you like it i mean it's Delicious at 50%. I'm going to add a little bit of water just to see what happens to it. I think under normal circumstances, drinking it rather than tasting it, I'm quite happy at 50%. It doesn't, it doesn't burn like some cask strength whiskies can at that level. Um, and that's, that's quite worrying in many ways. That's interesting, actually. When you add the water to that, for me, you just start to get that that hint of the peat from the Scottish barley. Definitely. Mm. Really good. Really well balanced, and that for me is 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 key. Yeah. All of these whiskies for me are really nicely balanced. Um, they're not too sweet, not too dry. You've got plenty of fruit, but plenty of structure. And that's what you're looking for, really. So the Solist range is the kind of highest level of Cavalan currently in the in their the, the core range. So you have the classic which is the flagship we tasted earlier on, the Concert Master, which is a portwood finish. You've got the King Car Conductor, which is another great whiskey. Um, there's the Podium and there's one or two others. Um, but then, you know, for the, for the real serious connoisseurs, um, you've, got this, you've got the Solist uh, range, which is essentially the single cask range. That's what they call it. Um, and they have a, a real plethora of different casks that they use. <sighs> Honestly. Um, and this is, this, this is probably the first one I tasted back in, back in the day, uh, which is the sherry cask. There are more specific sherry casks. I, th I think sherry cask for, uh, for um, uh, Cavalan, I think default is Oloroso, but you may need to check that. But they also do a Fino cask, a Montiado cask, port cask, cognac cask. Uh, they've done various red wine, ex bourbon, and so on. So it's it's really where they get the chance to to experiment and have some fun. Um, and we have fun tasting, frankly, lots of fun. They even did a peated cask as well, which was which was quite fun. So they are going to be producing a peated whiskey at Cavalan, uh, or they are already. It's just not been. Uh, it's not even for Cavalan, so it's not old enough to be released yet. But they have done a peated cask. So it, similarly to places like Pendere in, in in Wales and one or two others, where they've taken their whiskey, put it into a cask that previously held Lafroig or whatever it may be, a smokier Isla whiskey. Um, 
for a few years and the, the impact on it is, is actually quite dramatic, actually. Um, but anyway, I'd be interested to taste that actual peated stuff. So this is the Solist Sherry. So on here, you always have the cask number and the bottle number. So this was bottle 505 of 526. which would have come from a roughly 500 litre sherry butt. Let's see what you think to this. Quite often, this will be the favorite whiskey of the night for a lot of people. What you'll find is it's a really mouth filling, almost head filling experience, isn't it? It just really just swamps you with, with unctuous spicy flavor and aroma which is just well i know it sounds ridiculous but intoxicating okay <clears throat> and so i mean i think it says on your sheets but it says that it's around 140 150 quid something like that reason it says around is that it changes because uh, the output from each cask is slightly different and it necessitates a slight change in price from time to time. Um, I mean, it sounds like a lot of money, but I, I, these days, okay, I struggle to, to think of a, whis a new whiskey, a whiskey off the shelf at 140, 150 quid that tastes as intense and purposeful as that that's that that's my challenge to you okay um yes you can buy stuff on auction if you're lucky that might challenge it but a new whiskey scotch or otherwise mm. at that at that price i think i think you'd struggle but anyway that's the end of this tasting ladies and gents i hope you've enjoyed it um, please remember that we do do lots of other tastings and tasting packs and we'd love for you to join us again one day. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.